welcoming Baron Dixler. Wow, this is, uh, for me, this is a little like Woodstock, so thank you all for um, being here. I'll do my rendition of uh, Star Spangled Banner later. But really, thank you for coming to the museum um, for this great opening that um, Linda and her staff have worked so hard to put together. And thank you, everybody, for coming to this talk. So in terms of the, the background on the project, I've been thinking about the Valley for a long time. And I grew up actually in San Luis Obispo um, on the Central Coast. And I just have these memories, these very vivid memories of like coming over the hills into Kettleman City and just looking out over the valley and that perfect long horizon line that is so flat that it almost looks like you're staring out to sea. And I just remember being filled with a lot of awe and maybe a little bit terrified of, of the immensity of that landscape, especially coming from a relatively quaint Central Coast town like San Luis Obispo. And becoming a photographer, it was, I always, it was something that I always wanted to come back to and never quite knew how to approach doing that. And in Thanksgiving in 2006, I had some free time and I happened to have a handful of uh, rolls of film with me and a camera. And I just thought I'd go out and poke around and see what happened. And that one afternoon of, of noodling around with the camera actually turned into a three-year odyssey that led me back and forth across the valley. And probably 2,000 miles later, this is the tip of the iceberg of, of what that yielded. Unlike some photo projects that, that start out with a very clear kind of trajectory and timeline, and this was very different for me because the Central Valley, the Great Central Valley, the San Joaquin Valley is a, a, a subregion of that, is basically the size of England. So setting out to somehow do justice to the complexity and diversity of that landscape is it's quite an undertaking. So for me, it really started much more as a personal photographic journal of some of the things that I saw, and it was very exploratory. And it wasn't until really later when I started looking at the work coming together that a more, more of a narrative started to emerge about what the pictures meant and, and how I wanted to share this with the world eventually. And my statement posted out in the vestibule there probably does a much more efficient job of explaining that than I'm going to do here today. I uh, definitely invite you to, to, to read that. And so when I'm working in this sort of exploratory manner as opposed to setting out and, and having a particular problem to solve or a set of, of constraints. What the problem with tackling something like this is that it's the, there are so many options and so many places to go that it's, it's hard to kind of find your way through that at first. And for me, it's very much about reacting to what I'm seeing visually and driving around sometimes hundreds of miles a day you know, in a landscape that, that often is pretty featureless. The vast majority of what I do is not photographing at all. It's actually looking, looking for things to photograph. But, but when I see something that interests me, and it's hard to explain how that chemistry happens in your brain, and I think when, you, when you're, your job is to explore the visual world and make some sense of that, you just have this maybe sixth sense of, of what could, if you treat it well, turn into to a powerful picture. And so for me, you know, the challenge is taking that experience of being in a landscape, and I also photograph um, industrial sites, and I've done a lot of work in the mining industry, and I am in such a state of awe when I'm out working and just existing in these landscapes. And sometimes there's a fair amount of danger involved. The agriculture project, it's more an issue of people being suspicious of why somebody like me would be there with the camera um, and poking around. But other times, some of the areas that I'm exploring are actually pretty dangerous. And so what I try to do in my pictures is communicate that sense of awe. And that immediate kind of visceral reaction that I have is something that I try to capture on film. And then to have a venue like this where you finally have to get down to brass tacks and make some tough decisions, um, both in terms of the narrative and the quality of the images, a gallery setting like this or a museum setting like this is just as much a part of my process as clicking the shutter when I'm out in the field. So thinking about how um, you know, I might approach the valley landscape when, when the idea for this uh, really started to take shape, and I wasn't initially set on photographing it with a focus on agriculture, but it just felt like agriculture was the most honest and direct way in. 
I mean, the, the importance of agriculture in the valley is, is pretty indisputable. Something like 15 to 20 percent, I think, of the nation's food supply is actually grown in the, in the great central valley. For Fresno County in particular, I think 50, over 50 percent of the land in the county is actually dedicated to agricultural use. Uh, which is very interesting, although that is um, that's shrinking. So as we have tensions between um, housing development, things like that, the actual amount of farmable land is 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 shrinking. But just to put it put it in a little better perspective, Fresno County. Some of you may not know, but Fresno County is actually the single highest producing uh, county in the United States in terms of the value of its agri- agricultural product. So in the mid-2000s, which were the latest statistics I could find, that number was over $4 billion. So on one hand, you know, we have this, this incredible agricultural productivity, and it's something that I think many people who live in the Valley are, are rightly proud of. And then on the other hand, you have basically the undeniable impact of all of that productivity on the land. And so I'm really interested in looking at this incredible industry. And in the 1920s, um, President Calvin Coolidge was one of the first to refer to agriculture as a great industrial enterprise. So we we have all this agricultural productivity, but I'm also interested in exploring, well, what price do we pay for that? And I feel like it's a question that really bears uh, bears inquiry. It's important, and it it impacts all of our lives. You know, most of us, when we think of farming, if you were not to be in this gallery right now, we would probably have a a slightly different image in our mind's eye of what farming looks like. And I I was interested in exploring, well, why is that? Where are these other images of farming coming from? And, you know, what comes into my mind, you know, I think about small family farmers, I think about amber waves of grain, and, and, you know, rolling hills, and, and, you know, these images, as I started to unpack that, I realized that those are coming from food packaging, those are coming from advertising, those are coming from kind of public discourse around agriculture. But there's also deeper roots to that tradition. And my exhibition's called A New Pastoral. But the pastoral form is actually a form of, of, you know, poetry and writing that goes back probably at least three three or 4,000 years. And it's a, a mode of telling a story about the land and about farming and about agriculture. It tends to be more on the romantic side <laughs> and to see the, you know, the rural landscape as sort of more of a paradise. And so I'm maybe slightly ironically evo- evoking that, that concept in, in the title of this. And I don't want it to be cynically ironic, but certainly, I think, challenging that notion of, um, of, of agriculture being this, this low impact kind of um, state where man and the natural world are in perfect harmony with each other. And so what I really wanted to do was um, explore some of the harder, more industrial aspects of that and, and somehow map the differences in my own mind between this kind of high gloss vision of agriculture and how it actually is. So when I started to do some research around that topic, it it became clear that actually agriculture is incredibly high impact, much more so than I ever um, than I ever really appreciated. I made passing reference a moment ago to some of the kind of engineering marvels that have have really changed the valley landscape, and one of those is what's called the Central Valley Project. Um, And this happened in the earlier part of the 20th century and took many decades to complete, but it basically completely. Uh, rewrote the landscape of the valley. And a huge part of that was developing the state's water system. The Great California Aqueduct is probably the most recognizable to people, but many don't realize that the valley is actually this incredibly complex and sophisticated system um, of dams, rivers, uh, pumping systems, things like that. And actually, the, 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 the California water system is actually the single largest consumer of electricity in the state. So the Im- immense amount of energy that it takes to to provide the infrastructure, especially water, to create all of this fertility is, is really incredible. And you know, the, there are aspects of the, of the Central Valley Project you know, that are visible from space. You know, and then moving into things that maybe aren't so visible to the human eye. You know, the development of petrochemical fertilizers um, in the 20th century, and many of those were actually repurposed by companies like Monsanto from, from really nasty chemical agents like Agent Orange. And those actually became our, our, our fertilizers and our pesticides in kind of the mid-20th century. So 
you know, the downstream legacy of that, so to speak, is there are huge swaths of, of land in the valley that are what are called brownfields, but they're basically, they've been so polluted with petrochemicals and other nasty stuff that there actually nothing will grow there. And if anything did grow there, it would be incredibly unhealthy. In terms of the human impact, of course, of using those chemicals, there are cancer clusters in many towns in the valley, and so that's a huge impact. And then I've been thinking a lot lately, too, about ranging from you know the huge terraforming projects and water projects that are visible from space to the kinds of interventions that you can only see with a microscope. And in terms of genetically and genetic engineering and genetically modified organisms, we're actually altering the fabric of life. And what is what does that mean? So from 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 the macro to the micro, we're altering our world in service of agriculture. With that, I'd like to just talk for a second about the installation of of the room here. The, the overriding kind of thing for me was with, the in, with my interest in, in agriculture and these tensions between you know, the natural and, and the built worlds, how could I develop an installation for the museum that somehow would represent a, or at least echo back to some of those concerns? And so I've developed the grid system to, to kind of represent that technological side and that control and that regimented approach to building spaces, and I've tried to then also use this sort of broken grid thing where the grids are taking different shapes and they're almost morphing. And so while, it, while it's very built and very designed, um, you see these clusters sort of falling apart from each other. And then I also don't really ever think about what I'm doing in terms of indi individual images. You know, you might look at a single image and say, I really like that one, or I don't like that one, or whatever, and, and I certainly have those reactions as well. But for me, it's much more about the body of work, and I don't really, and maybe this, this is just my limitations as a photographer, but I don't have a lot of faith in my own ability to tell the story that I need to tell through an individual image. So what I'm trying to do with these, with these clusters is show a broader kind of set of pictures. But you'll notice as people step away from the walls and you kind of look at how things are hung, there are actually geometric relationships between different images in the clusters. And you'll see, so for instance, the very opening series there, you see this um, dairy processing plant sort of morphing into the body of the cow in front of it and things like that. So it's not so much about the individual images, it's about all of these wonderful things that start happening when you put those images together in a room. I want it to signal that this is a different kind of viewing experience and that it's a space that's gonna challenge you a little bit and it's not about standing in front of one image and soaking up you know, its beauty and glory. It's really about the experience of viewing a body of images and, and again, seeing how those interact with each other. And on the topic of seeing and uh, the right to see and the ability to see. Um, I just want to end with a little bit of a coda that I was recently interviewed by a couple of photojournalists about my work and the background noise for that interview was basically what has become known as the Florida Farm Bill. So an early version of that bill made it, and I'm quoting directly here, a felony in the first degree um, for any citizen of the United States to take a photograph of a farm or agricultural operation from a public highway or public space without the express written consent of the farm operator. For somebody like me with a horse in that particular race and a possible criminal record, uh, to, not, not, not in the past, but potential future criminal record, you know, in, in our world today when we have one, so many things competing for our, our, our attention, our visual attention especially, and then a lot of other forces politically and socially that are trying to limit what we have visibility to and what we have access to in terms of information, whether that's visual information or conscious you know, writing or product or whatever. To have a venue like this where, where these things can be seen and we can talk about these issues and get dialogue going um, is incredibly important. And this is stuff that hits close to home in California and the Central Valley especially. So I just want to thank you and your staff for the great work you do.